And our nature is that we're already awake, that we've already woken up. And that's really interesting, you know, to, to see that. And, and I just remember, I remember when I had my awakening really clearly in 81, at a certain point I was like, oh, I have to, you know, I was a little bit off balance or just inflated, which is normal at that point. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I have been looking forward to talking about this subject for such a long time now, and it is an honor to be sitting here with Paul Levy, the author of four books, including the one that I've just been diving headfirst into, Dispelling with Tico. And with that, welcome to the pod, Paul. How are you doing? Yeah. Oh, I'm doing great. Yeah. I just really appreciate the invite. Thank you. Yeah. So let's dive straight in to make the most use of your time. So let's just start with Watiko. It's so hard to put words to, but I like to say that this podcast is an educational resource for people that are starting to wake up and new to spirituality and really not might not even have had a experience quite yet that this is a waking dream. So with that in mind, um, if you could explain these type of things, like we're talking to a five-year-old to make it super simple for us to understand um, the easiest, that would be amazing. So how would you right. explain? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I think five-year-olds would probably, you know, more easily understand my work than maybe a lot of adults actually. It's true, right? They haven't been, you know, really conditioned and hypnotized under the collective spell. So, yeah, now, so the whole idea with the Watiko, um, which is a mind virus, it, it's a Native American term, and it really, um, you know, they, they sort of characterize it as a cannibalistic spirit. It's really the spirit of evil, um, but yet encoded in the Watiko mind virus is actually its own vaccine, is actually not only its own medicine, but it actually is helping us to wake up. But if we don't have the recognition of that aspect of it, because it's like a quantum phenomena that contains the deepest poison and the greatest medicine, if we don't have the recognition that it's actually helping us to wake up, then it'll kill us. And it's it's a real, I mean, it is like, you know, I think about there are some spiritual books, you know, um, Don Juan in the Castaneda books, he doesn't use the word Watiko, but he talks about the topic of topics. There's nothing more important in the world that I can guarantee then understanding what Watiko is showing us. And, you know, every spiritual tradition, they have different names for Watiko. So you don't have to use the name Watiko, you know, it's, and not only spiritual traditions, but artists and thinkers and philosophers from time immemorial, they're all pointing at Watiko and, you know, just by their own name. So in essence, it's a psycho-spiritual disease of the soul. It exists in the collective unconscious which is to say it exists in potential within all of us, okay? And it works through the projective tendencies of the mind, through our unconscious, through the part of us that has this, this blind spot. And it works through the blind spot, the projective tendencies of the mind in such a way that it entra- we entrance ourselves. We literally hypnotize ourselves. So I could, I mean, I could just go on and on. It's my life's work. And keep in mind, I'm not writing as a scholar or an academic or a philosopher. I had a, this lived experience with Watiko. It came into the Petri dish of my family and it completely destroyed my family and almost killed me. And, but the whole while I was taking notes and, and um, I was understanding, wow, something is, I'm seeing something here. There's some higher dimensional process that actually was being shown to me. And I've been fortunate to not have been destroyed by it. And it's informed, it's been the inspiration for my entire work. That's just a little bit, I can say a lot more, but you know. Yeah, I think it would be helpful for people to hear a little bit about your own personal awakening and the mis- uh, diagnosis. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm happy to share about that. So basically, I was, you know, um, by by all standards, just, you know, a fairly happy, healthy kid, really good at school, you know, just lots of friends, just this, this normal life. And then all of a sudden, particularly when I was in college, 
as I was separating from my family, because I'm an only child, and particularly from my father, you know, and I was individuating and, you know, getting into art and doing psychedelics and smoking pot and just the normal stuff that people do, I think, in college. And um, that created enormous trouble with my father, who is, you know, without going to the story, he was so identified with me and, you know, just getting off on my accomplishments as a really smart kid, that as I was stepping out of his image of who he wanted me to be, it just, you know, precipitated this unbelievably murderous, demonic abuse, emotional abuse on his part that basically created this incredible suffering to, in me to the point where without going into the specifics, though I did write a 600 page book about it, about the abuse, which was very healing. But basically I went from being a highly functioning person to, to not being able to live my life. And, and that, so it stopped me in my tracks. And then I went so inwards, you know, just, you know, assuming the witness being the observer of my own mind, you know, just doing meditation really for a few years that I wound up having this life transforming spiritual awakening. I got hit by a bolt of lightning while sitting in meditation, just in my brain it ignited. And then within the next 24 hours, I was having this overwhelming experience of realizing we're having a collective dream. So I was so ecstatic and enthusiastic. And from my friend's points of view, I had had this radical personality change overnight. So I get immediately like by ambulance brought to a hospital and, you know, diagnosed and pathologized. And what saved me is that I knew I was having a spiritual awakening. It couldn't have been more obvious to me. And um, so as I was being diagnosed and in the next, you know, maybe 18 months, maybe four other times I was hospitalized because I was just a free agent having a full blown spiritual awakening, but I hadn't integrated it. And so I wasn't skillful in the way I was expressing what I was realizing. And every time I got diagnosed and then the final time I got, you know, put in the hospital for three weeks because they were going to stabilize me on medication, which I was supposed to be on for the rest of my life because they were saying, you have this mental illness, you'll have it for the rest of your life. You need to be on medication until your dying breath. You know, I, I just was like, wow, these people have no idea. They're really ignorant about you know, because it was in the early 80s before people even had a sense of spiritual awakening or anything like that. But that's what saved me, that I never for a nanosecond bought into their diagnosis. But the thing which was interesting, I went from having this, you know, unmediated direct encounter of archetypal evil through my father being the instrument to act out his abuse, to then I was in psychiatry and I recognized, oh, it's the same archetypal evil energy, but now it's changed channels into psychiatry. So that then I began to realize, oh, it's like this evil, dark energy non-locally pervades and is enfolded within the field. And so that was the beginning stages of me tracking the Watiko, because Watiko, it's non-local. It's not bound by third dimensional space time. It exists in the collective unconscious in a higher dimension of our being. And, um, you know, that's to say that we all potentially have it or can have it at any moment. So that was really the story of, of how I first encountered Watiko. And that's the context for, you know, how I wrote my books. And then it took about many years, like 12 years, 13 years. I was so traumatized by both my father and psychiatry of just working on myself and going to therapy, going to therapy, connecting with my dreams, making art, studying young, doing Buddhist practice, studying alchemy, doing shamanic journeys, anything and everything I could do that would help me, you know, and then in about 93 or 94, I realized, well, you know, I'm not fully enlightened or healed or anything. And, you know, I never will be. I don't know if anybody ever is, but at least I had realized, well, I was coherent and integrated enough that I recognized that I'd gotten a gift from my ordeal, which was like this, this, you know, going through an initiatory experience in which I could, I could offer my gift. I could help people. I realized that what I had learned from it was medicine for other people. And so that's when in 94, I think when I began teaching and opening up my practice and starting my groups, you know,
Thank you so much for taking the time to explain the background and the story. And a, a lot comes to mind, right? And I want to go back to that moment in meditation when it felt like a lightning bolt came in and you had the realization that this is a, a collective waking dream, right? Um, my question for you is you mentioned psychedelics. Now, psychedelics are definitely a tool to help us wake up. I'm curious, like around that time, what was your relationship to psychedelics? Right. At that time, I was doing, you know, probably about on the average of four hours a day of meditation with the occasional psychedelic, whether it's like the, you know, um, psilocybin or LSD, but just, you know, not that often really. Right. Occasionally, where now, you know, so many of my friends and people in my groups, they're, they're all, you know, uh, doing plant medicines and, you know, and it's really helping them. And I hardly do that stuff at all. Now, I mean, I'm going to be 65 next month. And, you know, I hold that medicine in high, the highest regard. But the idea is, is whatever you're being, you know, given this gift, you're, you're seeing something and then you have to do the work. You have to do your inner work. And the shadow side is for people to get dependent on the medicine, you know, mm -hmm. to have another ecstatic experience. And, but then if they're not integrating it. So, yeah, no, it was part of my process. But, you know, the major part, really, um, I can't say enough how seriously, I mean, think about it, four hours a day, average, every day for, you know, and then in the middle of sitting in meditation, that's when the lightning bolt just ignited. So, so what did it feel like in that moment in terms from an analytical point of view, like, um, what was this realization? Can you explain what the collective waking dream is for people that might not be familiar yeah. with this? For sure. So basically what it was, it was like I was, I was, I was waking up and I was waking up inside of a dream. So I went from just being in, in waking life, thinking it's real and ordinary and normal, like we all do and objective and solid and separate from me to all of a sudden my consciousness was expanding and I was realizing, oh my God, I'm in a dream. I am literally in a dream and we're all the dreamers, all 8 billion of us humans and all the other sentient species. We're like co-dreaming it up together into materialization. And right in on that day, stuff began happening in my life that was physically impossible. And that could only happen in dreams. And then I was actually within the week, I was beginning to meet the first of my teachers, particularly when I was around, you know, they were, they were real authentic spiritual teachers, you know, from Asia who've now become like family members. I've known them for like close to 40 years or, or so, but um, particularly when I was in their field, it was like the third dimensional space time continuum would like warp and, mm. and stuff would happen that was like not possible. And yet, it was happening just like it, like right now, phenomenologically, nobody could convince me that I'm not talking to you in this moment on this podcast. Well, that's my subjective experience. It's completely convincing. That was the nature of the out of the ordinary experiences. They were, they were as real to me as, as right now is, you know? One thing that I've noticed in the waking up process, which I want to mention, um, I really liked how you said that you don't necessarily know, believe if anyone's totally reached enlightenment, right? And I talk about this a lot because people will say like, you know, awaken or things like that. And I, I try to think about it more as a process to waking up and having these experiences. And that seems like that's in alignment with you. Yeah, where I was going with this is like in my own journey of waking up to this collective dream, of course, like I have those experiences where it's just super profound and undeniable. But then I have those other type of experiences where I feel like I'm back in like that robot sleep mode, you know, and yeah, one yeah, thing yeah. that I've really noticed is that when you're starting to wake up, you need to be extremely careful and intentional with your thoughts. Because if you start to think negatively that will unfold, which on the flip side, everyone wants to manifest, right? Everyone wants to bring more abundance and more joy, more happiness, fulfillment. 
this is an opportunity to do that. Is there anything you could speak to in terms of your experience of how you might not have realized what you were thinking and how it would unfold in the waking dream? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, what you're saying is so right on. I mean, in Dhammapada, the saying, the Dhammapada, the saying, so the Buddha, the very first line that the Buddha says is we create the universe with our thoughts. And, you know, and that's analogous to this being a dream that this universe is not separate from consciousness. And, you know, quantum physics is pointing out, for example, that, you know, consciousness is not separate from, you know, from physical reality, that the two are indistinguishable. So what you're pointing at is that we, each one of us, we possess this unimaginable, or up until now, this vast creative agency and power. And we, we have it 24-7. We already, we, we've been using it every moment of our lives, but to the extent we're unconscious of it, we've been, we've been using it unconsciously such that it's, you know, turned in a way sort of destructive towards ourselves. And so what you were like actually articulating is that, yeah, we, all of us have this incredible power in our minds, in our very being. We're creative beings. We're made in the image of our creator. That's the medicine for this mind virus, for Watiko, to the extent that we're able to consciously um, tap into our creative power and realize, and this is exactly what I wrote a book about this, what quantum physics is showing us, that we literally are creating our experience of ourselves and our experience of the world each and every moment. There's no one else doing that. Yes, stuff happens, you know, and, you know, whatever. But we then, out of whatever's happening, we're the ones by, by placing meaning and interpreting what's happening, we're literally creating our experience. We have this enormous power to do that. There's no one else doing that to us. We're doing that. And what I'm pointing at is that when we start getting in touch with ourselves as create, creators, creative beings, and we connect with other people who are also awakening to that, that's when all bets are off. That's when we can actually put our realization together in a way that makes a difference in that we can change the waking dream. And that's not new age magical thinking. Woo, that's like what's being offered to us. We're actually invited to participate consciously in our own evolution. That's what my work is about. One thing that comes up for me when I hear you talk about this is um, I even have a poster I just put up in my office here of uh, the Truman Show because it's a it's a good reminder to not take all of this too serious. But I do feel like we're each living our own version of the Truman Show. And I'd like to talk about switching timelines because, yes, we're all one. Right. And I think you even wrote in your book. So I forget exactly what you said, but like you, it doesn't have to the concept basically. And maybe you can jump in here. It's it's not that we have to put all of this work into eventually getting to this realization and in flipping our reality. If we can make the conscious decision to do it now, then that's reflected in the outer world. Does that, is that kind of what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, well, well, you know, I mean, the only time there ever is, is now. So, right. you know, these, these understandings have to be implemented in the present moment. There's nowhere else where they ever could be, you know, put to use. And the idea being, being that there's no objective universe, there's no, and this is quantum physics has proven this, you know, in that what they mean is that this world doesn't exist as an object that's separate from us. We're actually part of this universe, influencing the very universe we're a part of via our act of perceiving the universe. It's all one quantum system with no separate parts interacting. And, you know, to see that, that's pointing at that any one of us, you know, when we have an expansion of consciousness, you know, step out of being caught by our unconscious or by our complexes or identified with our shadow or just turning away from, you know, being in relationship with a darker part of ourselves. So in other words, when we expand our consciousness or add that quanta of light to us, that instantaneously gets deposited and reflected back in the universe that we're not separate from, you know? 
Right. So one thing uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, in 2019 is when I had my first true spiritual awakening experience. And then I went deep down the path. I was like, I want to know everything about this. And I changed my whole entire life. That's why I started this podcast as well. And I would hear a lot of people in the spiritual community say that, oh, people are waking up. People are waking up like this is, and don't be discouraged. And I had so much just grief uh, for lack of a better way to put it. And just uh, disbelief that the world would wake up. And then all of a sudden when COVID hit, I felt in my very bones that the world is going to start to wake up and we can dive into COVID later. But what's interesting to me is going back to the switching timelines and what you were just talking about. Since I woke up, my inner world woke up. It was as if I switched a timeline and the outer world was starting to wake up at a much more rapid pace. Is that kind of the belief here? Yeah, well, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, being that what we see in the seemingly outer world is reflective of our inner state, you know, it's very, we have all the evidence, it's very convincing to think, oh, people are really asleep, you know, the world is asleep, which on one level is true. But then if we're seeing that, well, are we, is that a reflection of the part of us that's asleep compared to you know, to the extent that I deepen and stabilize the awakening part of me, I can see that part of people that very convincingly seems asleep, but I also see their nature. And our nature is that we're already awake, that we've already woken up. And that's really interesting, you know, to, to see that. And, and I just remember, I remember when I had my awakening really clearly in 81, at a certain point, I was like, oh, I have to you know, I was a little bit off balance or just inflated, which is normal at that point when you, you know, snap out of the consensus spell and you, you have a recognition of who you are. And I was like, oh, I have to help everybody wake up. And then I realized, no, 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 everybody's always already awake. I was the last person to wake up, you know, so it really switched it. Yeah, it really, um, when you're having those really profound experiences, like I can't even imagine what that would be like without medicine. I need to work on my meditation game. I'm not nearly close to four hours a day. So my awakening experiences has been with plant medicine, but um, one medicine I've been working with quite a bit recently is 5-MeO-DMT from the Bufo Alvarius toad. And that comes on really fast. And your mind can't catch up to understand it because it's a it's a feeling but yeah it, it can be earth shattering when you get these type of feelings and it it does feel like oh i am the last one to catch up like that i do get that feeling yeah 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 well i mean i'm very familiar with 5meo dmt from my own experience i mean i haven't i used to do it in the 90s oh, wow. i did it hundreds of times and then at a certain point i got the teaching and I just never did it again because I, I felt like, no, I understand. And it's really like incredible, like this, this training for the death process, you know, and the way I experienced it. And the point is to, um, you know, yeah, where we have these experiences, you know, insights, these understandings on plant medicine as we're journeying, shamanically journeying to, you know, higher dimensions in our being. And the idea is to really metabolize that and to assimilate and integrate that and, um, you know, and to embody it and then to creatively express that, you know, and we're all a work in progress on that, really. Totally. And this is where integration comes in. And we can talk about a few things here. And I have this concept of soul life balance rather than work life balance. And this just came to me right now. But part of the reason why I've had resistance, even to when work life balance, I first heard of it years and years ago, right? Like it just didn't seem right. And now I understand that it's this thing that the, the 
that was created to keep us from asking questions. You know, we glorify being a weakened warrior and things like that when this isn't our true nature to work so much. So the reframe is looking at work as a component of life and building in your spiritual or soulful practices on a daily basis, which help with integration. But as I think about this right now, that's the Watiko, the 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 work life balance, the the campaign of work life balance to keep us in that fallen state of consciousness, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so many of us were like, you know, sort of like these indentured sort of like these slaves in a way, these wage slaves to our jobs, you know, we've gotten ourselves into a situation where we're investing a lot of our psychic energy every day and every week and every year of our lives into this, this venture that isn't feeding our soul and doesn't allow ourselves to be creative because we're too tired when we get home from work. And I just want to bring up like, for example, myself, when I had my awakening, and then, like I said, it took me a number of years of working on myself, you know, and I, I had just jobs to, you know, support myself, you know, just in the mainstream. And but then once I had sufficiently integrated in like 94, then I realized, well, you know, my whole my big problem then was, well, what do I do that's in alignment, you know, that can help me to pay my rent? And then I realized, well, well, I'm having such a profound this 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 realization of life being a dream, wouldn't you think that then if I were to step into the dream, trying to teach and help people showing them how they could see this as a dream, wouldn't you think the dream would support me in doing that? And 100%, from that moment on, I've never had to work. And, you know, because I was, I was really sort of in my, in, I was congruent, I was in my integrity, I was really authentically following because what I was doing was following my path. There was a calling, you know, and we all have a calling. I mean, I talk about that in my next book and just like, you know, a healer like um, has a calling. And the key thing is, is to have the awareness or the courage to follow it, to ascend to the calling. And I was somehow fortunate enough to do that. And I think this maps on for so many of us that so many of us, if not all of us, we sense something is really wrong and, you know, really crazy about what's happening and things seem really dark and we're being called to whatever that looks like. You know, for me, it looks like, oh, I'm a writer and teacher or artist or whatever. It's not going to look that way for everybody else. And yet it's a key thing for people to have the willingness and the courage to really invest in their calling and to follow their calling. And the one final piece is that the sponsor of our calling is the same sponsor that will send you everything you need to accomplish your calling because it's the same source. So whether you need clients or customers or books or whatever it is you need to accomplish that calling, as long as you assent to it, then, and that's what Christ says in the Bible, like, you know, um, seek ye first the kingdom and everything else will be added. He doesn't say, oh, when you get the kingdom, you'll get everything. He says, no, just seek ye first. Prioritize, you know, the real highest value, what your calling is, and then everything you need will be given to you. And it's because the source of the calling is, the, it's the deep source. Yeah. And that's the tough part. That's the tricky part to find out what the calling is, because I'm in a fellowship mastermind. Aubrey Marcus is a fit for service. And I've met hundreds and hundreds of amazing people in this community. And one of the main things I've recognized is almost everyone without fail is going through a deep spiritual awakening, which comes with a career transition. So I'm so happy you brought up work because that's the tough part, right? Because you can have that understanding of, okay, now I want to shift from what I was doing because it wasn't resonating into something that is resonating. And as you put, step into the dream more, but it can be really hard to figure out what that actual calling is. So I'm curious to hear from you what that actually looks like when you start yeah. to step into the dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, totally. Well, for me, I think about for years and years, you know, a number of years ago, whenever I would do like plant medicine or do like a workshop where like, oh, uh, sort of like deep breathing or 
rebirthing or holotropic breath work, any of these different modalities, I would always have the same vision. And the vision was, oh, wow. And it was an atemporal vision. It was that I realized now it was outside of time and existed sort of in the archetypal dimension. And it was a vision that I, what I was going to be doing was helping people, was being in service. And, but the way it looked, I didn't have any of the details or the specifics, but it was basically, I was just going to be being myself. And, and just being myself was, and just, you know, doing whatever I would be doing, that was like the vision of my calling. And then fast forward a number of years, and I've been doing what I do now for like 25 plus years, and it's exactly what I was envisioning. I'm just, you know, I'm not part, I don't have a boss, I'm not part of a system, I'm outside consensus reality. I just do my own thing. And if people don't like it, fine, then they don't have to work with me. Um, but so many, you know, I have more people who want to work with me than I know what to do with type of thing. And so the thing why I'm, you know, kind of this story, it's indicative and how come I'm sharing it is because I think we all have that vision and I didn't have the specifics, but that just filled itself in as I was just investing and following that thread. And I think my imagination is we all have a certain like imagination or dreaming process around what it would look like, what it would feel like if we were really doing what we're here to do. Because the point is, we all have something to do here. We have like a mission, all of us. We have a vocation, which is related to the word calling, which is related to finding one's voice. And all of those etymologically are related to the inner guide, to the guiding spirit, to our ally, to our angel. And, you know, the idea is, is to really develop an intimate connection as if having like a relationship with our inner guide. It's the part of us that is us, but that's beyond just our conscious mind and it has wisdom and it's continually signaling and, and trying to communicate with us. And if we only, you know, stop just like having all the, the monkey mind and the white noise and just really open our ears and just listen, then we get guidance. And that's the real essence of like, you know, going to therapy from my point of view is connecting people with that, their own inner guidance system. Hmm. Yeah. There, there's a lot there and um, not to get too focused on work, but the more we talk about just all of this, uh, everything about this waking dream in the universe and everything, the more to me, it's just like, who cares about, and not who cares about work, but it's more like the money. And, you know, this, that's the Batiko in terms of having fear, you know, uh, fear of lack and that type right. of stuff. Yeah. And then that's why we get so f uh, fixated on what am I going to do for work? It's most of the time it's out of fear. And it's how am I going to make money? Whereas if we can look past the Batiko and step into the dream, then it's coming from a place of an open heart where you're being for of service. Um, so I love that. And one thing that's coming up for me too, when you talk about like kind of clearing out all the noise so that you can hear is the fact that time doesn't exist. It exists on, uh, on earth. Right. And however, there is no, I'm of the belief there's not necessarily past lives and future lives because everything is happening all at once. But one thing I can't comprehend, and I don't know if the brain can, but I'd love to hear you uh, riff on this a bit. How is it that our consciousness is plugged into our egos now, myself as Sam, you as Paul, but it's also playing out those other lives, quote unquote, past and present as well? Yeah. Well, you know, yeah, that's an interesting question, because when you said like time exists on Earth, I would almost say time exists in our mind, mm. you know, and that's one of the, the revelations of quantum physics, that space and time are just constructs. They don't inherently exist in the universe. You know, they're, they're not separate from our own mind. And the thing to me about what you're offering, which is really interesting, is that whatever our past lives, whatever that means, or whatever our past trauma that's unresolved and unhealed, it's all available right now in the present moment. It's informing our present moment experience. And that's really interesting because that points at that there's a way of carrying and being present with our experience in this moment 
that can actually like access and unlock those past traumas or past life stuff, you know, that could potentially be getting in the way of us just being a clear instrument and expressing not just, you know, our creative, you know, energy, but the creative spirit itself of the universe, you know, that comes from source, that that's who we really are, are these like instruments that potentially, you know, can be a channel for the infinite creativity of the universe to like recreate itself and express itself in this world through us. That's really interesting. And the way to unlock that is like we were saying, to be fully in the present moment, because that's where all of the past lives, future lives, past traumas, whatever, are all holographically unfolded in that moment. I, I've had a, a thought recently in meditation uh, where something where I was younger didn't happen that could have happened. And I could never make sense of why it didn't happen without getting into the specifics. And then I realized in that moment of meditation, it was like inner child type meditation work that I was going and visiting my inner child. And that by me doing that now is what kept that from not happening back then as a child. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I actually think so. Well, the thing you're pointing at, I'm not quite fully following at the end. I sort of, I lost the thread, but the idea that how we are, how we're investing our energy right now in this moment, that it's actually, we're either, you know, in a sense, extending back into the past and recreating the past to exist in a certain way or not. But like the access point of that whole experience is how we're expressing our creative energy right now. That's what I, you know, what comes up. Right. Yeah, totally. And I'm thinking of movies like um, Bill and Ted and Back to the Future. You've probably seen those, right? I saw, I didn't see Bill and Ted, but I saw Back to the Future. Oh, you got to see Bill and Ted. Uh, it's actually way more spiritual than it comes across and just like the bro silliness of the whole brand. It's kind of similar to Back to the Future. And when you start applying this type of thinking, even I just watched Shutter Island. Have you seen that movie? No. That, that's an amazing film that demonstrates what Tico, t which you would, I don't know if they intended to or not. Um, and that waking up process as well. But anyways, um, I've just had this thread recently of looking in our culture and seeing through the programming about how they're illustrating certain spiritual themes, but you would never even notice it. Right. Well, the thing is, what you're pointing at is that like, whether it's like the Watiko, like mind virus or these spiritual themes, you know, they they're emerging into our consciousness. And one of the ways that that happens is that it comes into pop culture, you know. And so, for example, with my work on like the mind virus on Watiko, so often now people are sending me, oh, wow this person is mentioning it. It's in this article. Oh, you know, so many people are talking about it. And because the thing about this mind virus is that um, it has no power, you know, if we see it, it only works. Because remember I said, it's a, it acts through our unconscious through the part of us that that's blind as a blind spot. So as long as we don't see it, it can act itself out through us. But the fact that these ideas like, for example, specifically like the mind virus, the Watiko mind virus, that it's more and more getting objectified and named and it's becoming part of the vernacular. That's like from the dreaming point of view, in other words, interpreting this as a dream, that's like expressing, oh, all of a sudden the psyche of our species is more and more becoming awake to that. There's this thing because it's not just like that our species is asleep. That's one description, but it's, it's more as if our species is asleep and there seems to be a darker force that's invested in keeping us asleep. And that darker force is Watiko. And like I'm saying, it only has power over us if we don't see it. And more and more of us are seeing it and naming it and creatively pointing at it. And it's coming up more and more in pop culture. And that gives me real hope, you know? Could you speak to how what Tico does and yet doesn't exist at the same time and four point logic? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the four point logic, that's the, the Buddhist logic and the, the quantum physics logic. And instead of, oh, what's true, A or B, the idea just very simply is like it's A and B. Like if something is something true or false, no, it's true and false. And it's even though it's contradictory, it's, it's really that's just that's the nature of things. And so when people hear about there's this like deadly mind virus that's, you know, I mean, it's been having its way with our with our species from time immemorial. You know, I don't mean to create fear in people. People shouldn't be hearing that and feeling like afraid or like, oh, no, there's this deadly mind virus. You know, there's something more I should be afraid of. No, no, no. It, the, the Watiko virus has no existence whatsoever. It doesn't even exist. It is no independent, intrinsic existence whatsoever, separate from our consciousness. And yet it can kill us. Okay, and that's the paradox. Because what that's pointing at is that we ourselves have this enormous, unimaginably vast creative power at our disposal, like I've been saying. But to the extent that we're not conscious of it, it's it's killing us. And it's like we we have this magic wand. It's like we're these we have a superhero power. But to the extent we either don't even know we do, or we don't know how to use it, Watiko which has no creativity, but it plugs into our creativity to serve its agenda, which is then, which kills us, okay? Now, the thing about Watiko, because it's such an amazing um, thing, it's so profound and, and you know, is that, it, like I was saying, it's, it's being, it's expressed in all different traditions. In the Bible, in the apocryphal text, they call it um, the counterfeiting spirit. And I point out, that yeah, Watiko was on the editorial board of the Bible. It made sure to edit out the counterfeiting spirit phrase from the Bible because that's exactly precisely Watiko. Because Watiko is a counterfeiting spirit, has no creativity, but it's a master impersonator. It will impersonate us. It'll put us on like a suit of clothes or like fooling us. And then it'll offer us this limited image of who we are. Oh, I'm not creative. I'm wounded. I'm traumatized whatever, you know, and then as soon as we, if we're not awake in that moment, we then identify with Watiko's image of ourselves, then we've given ourselves away because Watiko can't steal our soul, but it tricks us into giving it away. Then we've given ourselves away and we've identified with who we're not. And that's mad. That's a recipe for madness. And that's Watiko disease in a nutshell. How how does um would Tico relate to dark entity attachments like archons or even reptilians and things like that? Yeah, yeah. No, all of those are different, different symbols for what Tico, like the archons, the the Gnostics, they their word archon, that's the equivalent term for what Tico. They were mind parasites. That's exactly what Watiko is. And you know, reptilian would be another, you know, creative way of describing because one way of understanding, I mean, there is so many ways. I mean, that's why I've written three books about it now that it just, it's, you know, there are so many just infinite ways of describing it is that, think about it. So we have a trauma. What trauma does, the wholeness of our psyche splits. We, we dissociate because it's too overwhelming by definition to integrate. And so, but if that split off dissociated part of ourselves, if we don't, reconnect with that and integrate that back into our wholeness, it develops an autonomy, like a seeming will and this life of its own in such a way that in psychology speak, that's an autonomous complex. That's the phrase. That's what indigenous people would call that's the demon. That's a demon, autonomous complex. And it seems to be totally adversarial, like it's other than us. It, it has seemingly a life and will of its own, like I was saying. And yet, that's what Tico. And the idea is, is that the genesis of it was this trauma that actually a split off part of ourselves, you know, is unintegrated. So the idea is to the extent so in a shamanic way that we can, you know, recollect ourselves, retrieve our soul, remember all the dismembered parts of ourselves, put ourselves back together so that we're connected instead of disassociated, that actually, you know, connecting with our wholeness that's really in service of dispelling Watiko. It's so interesting. And I'm thinking back to your book, and I know you talk about this um, at length in the book, but if you could speak a little bit in terms of when you spot Watiko 
in others, how it may be a reflection of Watiko and yourself? Oh, sure. Totally. So say if somebody, you know, because Watiko, it's, it's a transpersonal energy, you know, and one simple way of understanding what I'm pointing at is that it can possess a person at any given moment, somebody that Watiko gets in the driver's seat of our vehicle and we become possessed so that we then act it out thinking we're serving our own impulses, but we're actually, you know, feeding this alien um, bug that's, you know, that's getting fed by our actions and behavior, you know, and it grows bigger and it, it kills us. So the idea being when we see somebody who's taken over by Watiko, who's possessed by Watiko, see Watiko, like the unconscious, when you see the unconscious in, in someone, you can't possibly see the unconscious without having your unconscious activated. It's a non-local energy. In the same way, when you see Watiko in somebody else, guaranteed it's going to trigger your own Watiko. So what, one of the ways of understanding that is that if you assume the position of, oh, well, they have Watiko and I don't, well, that point of view of separation and polarization and thinking they have it and you're free of it, that's showing you're under the spell of the bug right at that moment by having that perception. But if you then see what he go in them and you're triggered and you realize, oh, wow, what's that in me that's being triggered? What's the source of that trigger in me? And what I'm seeing in them, oh, they're um, possessed by Watiko. They're a dream character reflecting back the part of me that gets taken over by Watiko. Then all of a sudden you're not being this instrument for Watiko, but you're actually in the process of integrating the Watiko that's constellated in the field so that when you assimilate that, whether it's the next moment or in 10 minutes or the next day, you're then able to, to be in service and to actually be a benefit instead of just, you know, feeding unknowingly the Watiko that's, that's already there. I feel like for myself, like when I've spot the Watiko, I have naturally, even before, you know, I read your book or had tra training, if you will, around this, looked at myself and thought, uh, done some inner reflection and what I've found recently is now it's more of a neutral thing where if I spot it, I spot it and I recognize it and I try not to obsess over it. And I, I go inside of myself to see what's being reflected. And at least usually I haven't really been able to find anything. So does that mean I'm not searching hard enough then? Does that make no, sense? Well, well, the thing, just to be careful, because one of the ways Watiko works, I mean, you know, being a trickster is when you feel it and you look at it, oh, it might just shape shift and blend into the environment of your inner landscape so that, oh, there's nothing there. And it could be there's nothing there, or it could be you've just, you've just gotten deceived. And because it's a mind deceiver. I mean, that's what it is, you know. But at the very, you know, like it, it's to your benefit, it's your credit rather that you actually have the awareness to at least self-reflect. And yeah, maybe there isn't something there, but just to be aware that we're incredibly great at fooling ourselves. And with Watiko, we've tricked ourselves because it's a trickster. We, we've in a literal way tricked ourselves out of our right mind. And when that gets played out collectively, you know, in the body politic of the world, you have a collective psychosis, which is what we're in the middle of now. Right. Yeah. So there's there's really no easy answer in terms of what to do when you spot Watiko, but the main thing would be to self-reflect and look within. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And particularly when we're triggered, you right. know, because so many people, when they're triggered, they see the problem as the person who's triggering them. Oh, if only they would stop doing that, I would feel better. But, you know, the, the real training in this way is if somebody out there is triggering you, they're giving you a gift. And instead of indulging and putting your attention outside of yourself, because what Tico, what it does, it distracts us by, by we then put our attention outside of ourselves, thinking the source and the solution of the problem is outside. When all that I'm basically saying is that the real source of our collective madness is to be found within our psyche. It's a no brainer. So instead of indulging it outside, if we turn our awareness and self-reflect inside on what is the source of our own trigger, then the person triggering us has given us a gift because then we can actually add light 
onto an unconscious shadow part of ourselves. And we can shift um, what's going on in the dream, in the waking dream and with the characters as well. Uh, not always, but sometimes. Yeah. Well, because, because we're then in touch with our agency. We're in touch with our yeah. true power, you know? So unfortunately we only have a few minutes left and I know this isn't enough time to ask, but maybe it could be a teaser to what I think your next book is um, possibly about, but could you speak a little bit about COVID and how it relates to Wood Tico? Sure. Sure. So base in essence, I'm talking that, that COVID, the coronavirus is a lower level emanation of the higher dimensional Wood Tico virus of the mind, which is the real deadly virus that we should be concerned with. And, um, and the coronavirus, to the extent we think, oh, it's just this physical virus. Yeah, it has a physical vector, but that's, it's multidimensional. Think about how COVID has affected all parts of society. So much of our behavior, what we wear, what we think about, when we dream at night, what our dreams are like, you know, how close we get to each other, you know, financial institutions, political bodies, laws, governments, social interaction. It's impacting every aspect of our lives. And that's pointing at that there's not just a physical vector for the coronavirus, it has a mental vector, an emotional vector. You know, all these and all of those are parts of of like the subtle body of the coronavirus. And when you see that, you realize that all of those those aspects of the coronavirus are getting mediated through the psyche, you know, and the psyche is the one who changes the laws, who makes this decision or decides, oh, I'm pro mask or against mask or this or that. And the the psyche, that's the that's the realm of what so the idea is, is that the coronavirus, ultimately speaking, is not separate from the Watiko virus. And when you see what I'm trying to conjure up, the image, you, you begin seeing the coronavirus in this way helps you to see the Watiko mind virus. That's the point. Because if we don't see it, it's going to kill us. And if we see it, we take away its power and we empower ourselves. Thank you so much for that. All right. So... Coming out of close here, that's your next book is going to be a little bit more about that. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My next book, there's a big section on the coronavirus. I mean, it's all about what Tico, my next book, and comes out in this fall, um, the latter part of the fall. And definitely there's a big part on the coronavirus, you know, and, and you have another book coming out. Another book on what Tico coming out next year. Yeah, because, you know, I thought I just wrote one book and that's it. But then I just kept on getting these revelations and downloads. And I realized, oh my God, I plugged into something and I'm just, you know, the instrument. I don't identify with it at all. And it's because it's such a profound, it's sort of like taking a psychedelic and then it just keeps on coming on. It doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the experience. And so, yeah. And, you know, I'll probably write more books after these two, you know. Amazing. And I'll put your website, awakenindthedream.com in the show notes. Or the, you have a newsletter that people can uh, sign up for. Is there any yeah. other social media or anything else that you'd recommend? Not, for not really. I'm not kind of a social media person. Sure. I'm, I'm more just a creative artist and, you know, do prioritizing my work. You know, I'm not real good with publicity, you know. So people can just go to my website. There's Perfect. a ton of articles. It's all for free, a ton of interviews. And then if you want to buy an autographed copy of my book or I do sessions one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to do that. But yeah, I'm just wanting to get this work out because it's so important. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul, for taking the time to speak on my podcast, Soul Seeker. It's amazing what you're doing. Like I said, I only was introduced to you two months ago. So I have a lot of catching up to do because you've written four books already. So it'll be six by next year and I'm one in. <laughs> so definitely wow. looking forward to getting to know your material much better. Yeah. And I just really just can't thank you enough for the invite. Really. Thank you. Absolutely, brother. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.